Yaldabaoth. This was penned by my colleague and good friend Armand Rui. His work is philosophical, in contrast to my invariably scholarly approach, but we ultimately seek truth on the topic of existence and the archetypes that comprise, like faded and blurred mosaic pieces, this woven tapestry of time and pre-time. This section will be a companion guide to the Gnostic outlook upon Yahweh and other cross-theological concepts, but the parallels between the overarching polemic of this work is contained within the notion of Gnosticism and Gnosis. By this token, it is of the utmost importance that we flesh out these ideas, beginning to cogitate upon them in the light of the transversal end of the Piscean Aeon, and provide frontier braving luminaries such as our moon, the space required to posit his thoughts upon this most crucial of subjects. Without further ado, I shall now hand over to Armin. Quote, the Gnostic inclination is not a movement unified by any kind of conceivable orthodoxy, being individualist at its core, promoting internal self-observation and external observation of the self. It emerged long before, certainly, even the records of Eastern Mara and Maya. The individualism places man at the centre of creation, because it is the only creature therein capable of transcending it. This quality peculiar to man is given exactly by the concept that the essential spirit resides encapsulated in the human form. That is a mere crude copy of the Anthropos or the Kabbalistic Adam Kadmon. The primordial man is first emanated from the true essential source. Consequently, man finds himself trapped in a web of illusion, made up of physicality and mental subservience. Given the disdain for orthodoxy, Gnostic thinkers vary in their interpretations of this fallen state of man, which in fact is seen as the fall of the essential spirit into matter. Some, such as the Mandeists and the Manichaeists, see this fallen state of material reality as the result of the conflict between good and evil within God, a conflict that is eternal, that is, that lasts as long as time exists, with no resolution, but with individual salvation as a possibility. Others, such as some Egyptian Gnostics and the Platonists, see the material reality as the byproduct of the imperfection inherent to the subsequent copies that generated from the original essence. The author that is writing this chapter at present does not subscribe entirely to one view or another, seemingly aligned with the proper individualistic tradition of Gnosticism, but will expound upon that further on. Regardless of the views of the material world, they all agree that it is an imperfect and crude existence when compared to essential beingness, and also personify, in one way or another, the creator and regulator of this reality as a lesser, impure, or outright evil entity, whose names or titles vary, among others, from Yaldabaoth to Patahil to Araman to the Demiurge. In the pivotal Gnostic text Pistis Sophia, Yaldabaoth is presented as the aborted and abhorrent offspring of Sophia, the aeon representing wisdom, as she attempted to create without a male counterpart. Whether this Demiurge, and, and we will use the Platonist term here, more often due to its modern popularity, is seen as an outright evil entity or merely an imperfect one. Its metaphorical energy bears striking resemblance to Yahweh of the Old Testament. It is accurate to assume that this Yahweh usurped the qualities attributed to the One, God, in the scripture that makes up the Torah and Old Testament, as the very telling, Exodus 34 verse 14, this is the KGV version, outlines, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god." Unquote. And naturally, this is Isaiah 45 verse 5, again the KGV, I am the Lord, and there is none else, there is no god beside me. Unquote. That corresponds in the Apocryphon of John to, I am a jealous god, and there is no other god beside me which is correctly questioned in the subsequent verse of the same Gnostic scripture. This is the Marvin Meyer translation, quote, But by announcing this, he suggested to the angels with him that there is another God, 
for if there were no other god, of whom would he be jealous? Unquote. Of course, Yahweh does not reveal that he does take on the qualities of the Absolute, despite his evident relativity, shown in his jealousy and concern for worship and obedience. As we read in Isaiah 45, verse 7, again the KGV, quote, I form the light and create the darkness, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things, unquote. This preoccupation with forcing his followers to view him as if he was the one, that is depicted in the Apocryphon of John as, quote, the one is a sovereign that has nothing over it. It is a God and Father of all. The invisible one that is over all, that is incorruptible, that is pure light at which no eye can gaze. The one is the invisible spirit. We should not think of it as a God or like a God, for it is greater than a God, because it has nothing over it and no Lord above it." Unquote. This is again the Marvin Meyer translation. This shows that he cannot be, in fact, that very one. If we read further in the Apocryphon of John, the next section provides more qualities of the one that do not match Yaldabaoth or Yahweh, showing that his proclamation is a usurpation. Quote, it does not exist within anything inferior to it, since everything exists within it alone. It is eternal, since it does not need anything, for it is absolutely complete. It has never lacked anything in order to be completed by it. Rather, it is always absolutely complete in light. The one is illimitable, since there is nothing before it to limit it. Unfathomable, since there is nothing before it to fathom it. Immeasurable, since there was nothing before it to measure it. Invisible, since nothing has seen it. Eternal, since it exists eternally. Unutterable, since nothing could comprehend it to utter it. Unnameable, since there is nothing before it to give it a name. The one is the immeasurable light pure, holy, immaculate. The one is inutterable and is perfect in incorruptibility, not that it is part of perfection or blessedness or divinity. It is much greater. The one is not corporeal and is not incorporeal. The one is not large and is not small. It is impossible to say how much is it, what kind is it, for no one can understand it." Unquote. Marvin Meyer translation of the Apocryphon of John it is the author's own understanding that the Catharist idea that the God of the Old Testament is Satan and the Father of the New Testament is the essential God is inaccurate. Both have, as Silas presented earlier, qualities that link them to the oppositional force, albeit with different guises exactly to, again, usurp the perception of being the One. In this author's view, when the title of One is used within the framework of Yahweh, or the material world. It is a reference to the inversion of the quality of that pure light mentioned in the Apocryphon of John. In the material world, light is what allows one to see the individualized characteristics of creation, while darkness is what blinds one to them. Therefore, for there to be a one, God, from the other many that he is jealous of, he has to envelop the world in one darkness, in order to be worshipped as the supreme. The pure light would require no such unity, as it does not need anything, because it is, quote, has never lacked anything in order to be completed by it, unquote. In that sense, and even in accordance with most of the diverse Gnostic views, that darkness is equated with the Western concept of sin, which is not only an archery term, meaning missing the mark, but also derived from the Greek concept of hamartia, which means tragic flaw. Greek literally fault, failure, guilt, sin, from hamartian to fail of one's purpose, to err, to sin, originally to miss the mark, from Proto-Indo-European himer, to miss, fail. Consequently, darkness is seen as the state of sin, which is seen as a state and not a particular action per se. It is a falling short of oneself, a missing the mark of one's qualities. Therefore, the Lord of One Darkness, or Prince of Darkness from Manichaeanism, vies to rule the world, Earth, by pulling it into the world of darkness, as the Mandeists state. 
by making it as dark as it is through conversion. It is important to note that conversion is done through indirect means, such as suggestion or deceit, because Yaldabaoth does not have the power over the pure light of the spirit and is actually repelled by it. Hence the mythos that surrounds the imagery of Satan as the deceiver that can only convince man to join his cause, to perform his will and deeds on the world. Man's soul has always been the key spoil of the battle between good and evil, even in the institutionalized view of Christianity. Yet, it should be perceived that, given the correlations between Yaldabaoth and Yahweh and Satan, that the institutionalized version of the Western One God, Yahweh, is consequently also Yaldabaoth and so also Satan. So, in the verifiable esoteric layer of human society, the Demiurge fabricates, constructs itself onto both sides of the supposed conflict. In it, naturally, those souls in the world that have been most rejected and unintegrated are the ones most vulnerable to the influence of the dark temptation to become militants, worshippers, builders and soldiers of this darkness that tempts. If one feels outcast or abandoned and forgotten by God, one will naturally be more prone to join the opposite, the other side. Still, the side of God being the other good aspect of it also has its militants, worshippers, builders and soldiers. The Demiurge crafts both sides and suggests, deceives and stimulates them into a conflict with each other, claiming the fuel of their pure light as its own from these two opposing currents. This is all based on human instinct, human nature, the tenebrosity, the maelstrom of the human condition. It becomes as such an ebb and flow movement in spiritual social terms. At one point, the good, backed up by the energy of God, are in power and reject and oppress the evil that are then abandoned and recruited by Satan, to then eventually, and by following its instructions, take the seat of power later on, inverting the status quo, and then the cycle continues on, so on and so forth. Regardless of the sides in the seats of power, this game of thrones, it is always one aspect or the other of the same archetypal energy, guides and directs again and directly through suggestion and obedience its minions in order to fuel itself and its permanence. It is worthy of note that conflict itself is the process that feeds the Demiurge's furnace, the Fornax. And by the way, that is the reason for the woke and the anti-woke. It's the reason that BlackRock fund all of this, right? It is, and what we're discussing here essentially is, in a Jungian psychological perspective, are the archetypal forces of man that comprise the tapestry of man. So they use that to their, their, their own ends, right? They use those psychological chinks within the armour of man against man himself to manipulate man, to bring man into like the Demiurge, right? Which in Greek means craftsman, to craft his own prison, to love his servitude, so on and so forth. This is how despotisms and dictatorships take take hold, be it again on the right or the left. It doesn't matter, both sides are, are still part of the same primary dialectical strategy, the same primary dialectic. But as seen in the alchemical view, it is also the process that allows all the impurities, or sins, that is, the aspects that miss the mark, to be burned for purification. So one can metaphorically observe that there is always a loss at each turn after each age of war because it actually cleared up some of that pure light from its attached impurities, allowing it to escape back to the source. Of course, this comes from the point of view of the Gnostic currents that look upon the world as a hell, a prison for the spirit, with no other purpose. This is not the view of this author. That will be expounded upon further. A good example that can be observed of this dichotomy unifying in darkness lies on the modern day movements of what we could call woke ideology. That is essentially a response to the previous rigid religious orthodoxy, thus representing the two extremes that go from dominant to oppressed over time. 
In both cases, these movements vie to attack the potential balance in ours between the dual energy of creation, of feminine and masculine. For example, the subsection of what we would call wokeism will refuse the innate given dominant side defined by biology and try to, through several means, invert it, while feminism is a complete refusal of the masculine energy, so on and so forth. The latter is, in a very meaningful way, an actual recreation of the myth of Sophia, as shown in the Pistis Sophia scripture, that being part of the Gnostic tradition. Sophia being the feminine wisdom, here in the sense of women being emancipated through education when before they had been held from it by the opposite masculinism, rejects requiring the interaction with the masculine to create the new world. By the way, that also links to what we see in terms of the abysmal demographic trajectory of uh, the West. And families and marriages don't seem to, to stick together as they did in the past, right? So again, it ties into this idea of the shadow or the rejection or the unintegrated part of the Western psyche. And you saw it somewhat in the comments section of the previous two videos that I've done, where you have one side that will just, well, you have both sides really, that have their ideological camps set up and they fortified them. And by fortified, I mean that is analogous to they've isolated themselves and they view the other side along moralistic grounds. It is a literal, fundamental, diametric opposition. That divide cannot be bridged. And fundamentally, if we were to view every person as a cell within the body, politic, meaning the civilization, then what we are seeing is a dysfunctional body, a body where there has been an overabundance of resources and there has been this ideology of infinite growth, which funnily enough is the ideology of the cancer cell, you could state. The body is attacking itself. It is almost like an autoimmune response, an autoimmune disease. And that is what's plaguing the West. And it is of the utmost importance to bridge that gap. I know there is fundamental differences between people, but do not resort to, to violence. Do not resort to hateful generalizations. By right and left wing, I, I merely use those as broad terms, easy to define and conceptualize terms, so we can understand this fundamental difference between those who seek to conserve the traditions and those who are the shadow or rejection of those traditions, that rigid and orthodox application of those traditions in the past those people who were oppressed by those traditions. So those two fundamental sides are what encompass the culture war within the West. And it's what really has to be bridged if we wish to save Western civilization, or if simply we wish to individualistically save our way of life. So it is of the utmost importance to bridge these gaps. And by that, I don't mean find common ground. I don't mean compromise our positions. What I mean is not resorting to violence, not resorting to name-calling generalizations, not judging a book by its cover, which, again, I, I experienced a lot of in the comments section from primarily the left wing. Again, there was a lot of left wing people who were very, very open to the ideas that I was stating. And even if they disagreed with it, they were very cordial about it and they were quite civil. And that's what I'm talking about. That's the bridging of the gap that I'm talking about. To put your truth on the line, to be debated by other people so that common ground can be found, perhaps, or simply the marketplace of ideas can work and can operate and can find the best resolution to the problems facing Western civilization. And again, that mends the psychological problems within Western civilization. We live in the most mentally unwell times. A lot of people experience mental health issues. They're depressed, they have anxiety, they might be socially underdeveloped, you know, so on and so forth. There's a whole host of mental health issues that people experience. Another thing as well is that if you state a talking point that goes against another individual's belief structure, they take that as a personal attack. So continuing on, 
So she immaturely proceeds without guidance, simply making use of her power of creation and destruction like the Hindu Kali, believing herself completely self-sufficient and self-loving. Naturally, just like in the Sophia myth, within Gnosticism, she will eventually repent, noting the aberrations that she brought forth and the chaos she caused. This is the same myth as uh, the Mahakali or the, the Dark Mother, right? And she goes on a, a, a blood frenzy, a rampage, but eventually, and, and of course she stands on top of Shiva, the masculine, essentially what we're going through right now, but eventually that chaos subsides. There's actually a very interesting quote from the Old Testament that I always hearken back to, and it's something I actually covered within the Gnostic tradition. In Isaiah 66 verse 9, the Lord will not provide you pain without the promise of new life being born. And it's similar to that idea that I always as well harken back to, and it's from the alchemical slash Gnostic tradition, where it states, in the darkness, the light can more easily discern itself. And by that, what we are stating metaphorically is that even in the deepest darkness where chaos reigns and people are at each other's throats, the promise of goodness still remains and people can always turn away from the savagery. They can always find their humanity. It is the deepest impenetrable darkness which will lead people back to their humanity, which will lead people back to the light, back to goodness. It leads us to look at that reflection, that inconvenient, that uncomfortable reflection of what we have become, and we can use it as a place from which we can induce and construct positive growth, reconciliation of the two sides, of the conservative and the liberal, or whatever it may be, the conservative and the radical, the tyrant and the rebel, so on and so forth. Again, the light and its shadow reintegrating these things. This is thinking about this this problem within Western civilization from a very Jungian point of view, a very Gnostic or alchemical, even, dare I say, esoteric point of view. But I think it's, it's really great in the way that it informs how we go ahead from here, how we mend these problems within our society. So continuing on, Writing metaphorically and in mythological correlation, it seems only a matter of time before the feminist woman, after having been subsumed by her archons as did Eve, goes back into the world as a demon-possessed Mary Magdalene to find her exorcising Jesus and be saved. The balance between feminine and masculine is always key to the maturation of manifestation. Duality is inherent to the source albeit imperceptible in potential, due to its original balanced state. So it is by attaining that balance, not by rejecting the other, that manifestation can occur in a healthy form, as we've just described, bridging the gap. This was Sophia's mythological error in the Gnostic tradition, to take it upon herself to wield the innate power of creation, manifestation, she holds as a feminine aspect, without a masculine guidance. Now again, when we look at this idea of feminine and masculine, what we're discussing is not necessarily male and female. It is archetypal or psychological. Those are forces of the passive and the active. So in that sense, by that idea, we mean that which generates and that which limits, or that which generates or spurs on generation as a spark, and that which holds that potential of generation and processes it into manifestation through gestation, through acting as a vessel for that manifested expression of the of the spark of creation or whatever it may be. So that's what we mean by masculine and feminine here. Thusly, whether there is a rejection of the innate manifested energy in favour of its complementary or opposite, even if masked by non-dualistic attributes, which is what occurs in wokeism, or a rejection of that complementary dualistic energy replaced with a sense of independent self-gratification, which is what is observed with not only feminism, but masculinism. The result is always, inevitably, destructive. 
By that, what we mean is, for example, if you attempt to masculinize the feminine or feminize the masculine, what you're going to get is a greater manifestation of the unintegration or rejection that is present. You're going to make the shadow more intense. Now, again, we're speaking on multiple levels here, but just take that for what you will. I'm speaking from a psychological or young end perspective. But of course, you could view this from a political perspective as well, and it would still hold water as a concept, as an idea. So the idea in that sense is transferable. So continuing on, this author's individual view is that the source, in the case of our reality, symbolically, through its subset Sophia, was being, but did not know, and it wondered, who am I? Immediately projecting a reflected mirror image before itself that included all it was. Again, this is very similar to what we see in the Veil Guard, where the, the player character looks in to the, the black obsidian mirror, the scrying mirror, if you will, right? And looks at himself or herself or their self and asks, who am I? And they settle upon, again, depending on the options that you pick, if you want to be gender diverse, you can answer that question by the inverse of what you are biologically. Again, this has roots in essentially what makes up humanity from an archetypal perspective. Pride and rejection. And it's, it's interesting that we actually see pride and rejection crop up everywhere. I mean, it crops up, of course, with the word pride itself and its relation to our culture, our modern culture. It is of extreme importance when we're discussing these, again, very complex, and by that I mean contentious issues. That initial question then turned to who are you, as it addressed the image and judged it, separating what was pleasing from what was unpleasant. Again, this is the idea of the shadow, or the reflection, or the rejection, or the unintegrated aspects of oneself. Instead of the reflection of who you truly are, that being the reflection, instead of one viewing it in its totality, flaws and all, the reflection entices oneself, tempts oneself, in almost providing them an image of what they would desire, rather than what is. Ultimately, this is what drives civilization, and these internal battles within human beings, between pride and its rejection, also affect the collective unconscious. That then spills over naturally into civilization, into our social constructs, into society itself. The pleasant attributes formed a self-image that induced pride. This, by the way, is exactly what you read within John Milton's very famous Paradise Lost, the fall from heaven of Lucifer into Satan. The idea of pride, the desire that uh, is reflected back at you by the, the tempting shadow, which induces pride, and what, of course, comes before the fall? Pride. Because pride is an ontological position that rejects the flaws, the true and inherent flaws of one's being. Totally sweeps under the rug all of the flaws of one's own character. Instead of facing those demons head on and defeating the demons by integrating them, by ensuring that they no longer hold power over oneself anymore. As it mentions in the New Testament, remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against those forces, those psychic forces, which hold sway over our psyche, over our psychology, over our thoughts, our mind, which hold us prisoner. The pleasant attributes formed a self-image that induced pride. By the way, this links to the story of Lucifer and its fall, or his fall rather, into the form of Satan. So the fall from heaven to hell. Lucifer was the facsimile of pride, where Satan is the facsimile of the shameful rejection of the flaws that the reflection did not desire. Again, the reflection is pride. That is why, by the way, it's stated pride comes before the fall. So continuing on. While the rejected traits amassed into a shameful form and turned grotesque due to repression, God, or goddess, of self-image and the devil of rejected self emerge. Pride cast down the shame to hell, subconscious, as represented potentials, thus manifest in this reality. The, the maelstrom of chaos generating order. This is what 
encompasses creation. Of course, it's what encompasses our society as well. And it's what is at the crux of wokeism and the very bizarre frontiers that are being traversed and charted by late-stage Western society that, of course, is infected by postmodernism. Postmodernism is wokeism, essentially. Therefore, the purpose of the eternal conflict between pride and shame, between self-image and rejected self, is for both to eventually acknowledge each other and reintegrate in a metaphorical embrace. This is observed in the depictions of the constellation of Ophiuchus or Ophiacus, or the serpent bearer, where this dual wrestle and dance, again, you don't know if he's wrestling with the serpent or dancing with it, right? This friction of hatred and love is depicted when all the rejected is reintegrated through essential self-knowledge, gnosis. The two sides join and balance and time ceases, for there is no longer a need for linearity with the purpose of generating scenarios or events, right? Like what BlackRock do. BlackRock generates the division that we see throughout society, be it whatever social justice issue. These mentioned scenarios are contexts that vie to bring out not only the answers to the original question of who am I from an individualized potential point of view, but also to then integrate in their proper place that which was rejected as not self. The conflict emerges consequently from self-rejection, a prominent factor in the social movements indicated above and clearly observed by varied Gnostic currents. 